The Unshackled Waves, episode 243. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome back to another Waves episode. After Australia went to the polls on May 18th, it was Europe's turn to go to the polls with all European Union member states going to the polls to elect 751 MEPs in the European Parliament for the next five years. The UK still participated in this election due to the Brexit deadline being extended by Theresa May until October. But before the UK results were announced, with Nigel Farage's new Brexit party coming first with over 30% of the vote, Theresa May announced her intention to resign as Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister after the Parliament would not agree to her Brexit deal and the Conservative Party would not agree to hold a second referendum. Man who has been following the European elections closely and the Brexit Party in particular is the Unshackled Zone editor at large, Steel Archer. Welcome back to the show. Hi Tim, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here. Europe is such an amazing, uh, it's such an amazing political environment. That's why I like concentrating on Europe uh, and writing and doing things for the Unshackled on Europe. It's just incredible and we live in incredible times. Now, the, the winners of the, the European elections as a whole, there's all these different parliamentary groups. It's, it's confusing a lot of the time, but the winners were the, the hard Eurosceptic uh, groups and also the uh, hard pro-EU uh, groups. Uh, for, uh, for example, the, one of the hard Euro, Eurosceptic groups is the uh, Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy that has the Brexit Party, the Five Star Movement in Italy. They got 56 seats up. Uh, 15 yeah yeah the the five-star movement is a very hard, hardcore party um they're anti-immigration anti the uh the mediterranean crisis i guess um uh pro you know so pro sort of italian nationalist feeling pro yeah it's it's a, it's an incredibly dynamic movement um but it's very different to the brexit party in the north there it's very it's a very different sort of uh less hard uh brexit party feels a lot less hard line compared to some of these other ones and then there's the the european people's party which is the conservative pro europe party so it has change uk the uh, known as the the cuck party that's mm. actually what it is that was a, a coming together of uh soft conservatives and uh, Labour MPs who didn't like the, the Change UK. Change UK was only launched a few two two weeks, I think, before Nigel Farage's Brexit Party, and it did a dismal. I mean, it got l less than three percent of the vote. Um, the the lady, I forget her name now. She went on uh, Good Morning Britain, and she was saying, "Oh, the Brexit Party did absolutely terribly in the election." I mean, I mean, this this woman's a joke. Uh, Change UK is a joke, but yeah, soft conservative pro you you you. Uh, she actually essentially hurt um by not merging with some of these other you know like uh some of these other she should have either merged with the greens or she should have probably merged with lib dems and they would have done a little bit better yeah the people in britain they went with uh, the the pro-europe parties that already existed the liberal democrats and the greens now the, the european people's party which also has the the christian democrats in germany they won 179 seats down 38 seats. Then there's the Europe of Nations and Freedom. That's more, well, I hate to use this term, but they're described as the, the far right uh, group. Uh, so obvious, uh, obviously their focus is on not just getting out of the EU, but also nationalism against uh, immigration to Europe. That contains the National Rally from France, which used to be the National Front of Marine Le Pen, the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands of Gert Wilders, the Liga Nord in Italy, which is uh, Matteo Silva's party, and the alternative for Deutschland in Germany, the, the new Nationalist Party there. They got 58 seats uh, up 22 seats. Well, it's interesting because if you look at it sort of on a big scale, it's Germany that runs the uh, EU, uh, the, the, the Europe. It's essentially a European sort of um, enterprise, uh, it's a German sort of enterprise. And the more ADF that you get in there, uh, the more of these nationalist types that you get in there, 
the the weaker essentially the whole institution becomes regardless of what the uk does because the uk has always had special privileges with you know being out of the euro being out of the schengen zone and a whole bunch of they've always had a bunch of special privileges but it's really germany that you want if you to to, to increase its nationalistic tendencies if you want the death of the eu super state and as we touched upon, the, the European Liberals and the Greens, they, they all increased their representation in the European Parliament. Uh, but the Socialists and Social Democrats, the, the traditional centre-left parties, they all went down. And there was a trend all across uh, Europe. They're going to the, the extremes. The centre collapsed. Yeah, it's different. It's different to hear that what happened here in Australia. See, people... Um rallied to the center because they're still going on the the notion of the less of the two evils so um the same thing had happened sort of in uh the united states as well people rallied around republican as opposed to a third party um uh we here we rallied around the liberals as opposed to a third party away from labor because we knew that the liberals are a center party center left party so we might as well not go radical center center left which is what bill shorten wanted and in and in europe um europe is 52 countries it's the smallest continent there's 500 million people there they have great animosity towards each other all the different countries it's not going to be some sort of united happy peaceful um enterprise and people uh they're under their different nations have felt like they're not getting a good good end of the deal so they're having to go hard on either way uh on the left and on the right um all these smaller countries um and, and because a lot of the big countries like germany uh, and france they make a lot of these macro decisions based on what they can uh they can uh absorb in terms of punishment and it just doesn't work in the smaller countries if you're an austrian or you're a hungarian or you're a greek or something else you can't absorb that amount of pain that these that these larger countries can so um yeah so they're going extreme the center is collapsing which is uh what nigel farage has been saying uh 2012 uh, 2012 you can go and check his speeches where he said the center will collapse the the ra radical rise of the far right and the far left will happen and the uk doesn't want to be a part of that um so you know that's that's a big uh push for brexit um and that's why you had what we're going to talk about is the brexit uh party doing so incredibly well i guess and the uk went to the polls on a thursday that's that's their traditional voting day, but the votes weren't counted until the Sunday because, uh, not to prejudice the, the other nations who still had to uh, vote, but uh, on the Friday, uh, Theresa May, she announced that she was uh, stepping down as Conservative Party leader on June 7th, but would remain as Prime Minister until a replacement Conservative Party leader is elected. There's now a, a Melbourne cut field of candidates wanting to uh, replace her. Now, everyone was saying, oh, she got very emotional. You, you know, you like, can't help but feel sorry for her. But she was a failure as Prime Minister. I mean, she negotiated the worst possible Brexit deal, which was Brexit in name only. They were going to have all of the restrictions of the European Union, but not actually have it have a say in it. Yeah, so Theresa May is uh, incredibly funny because uh, although she said some of the words on uh, within within Parliament itself, um, her actions didn't didn't you know sort of translate to what she was saying she was trying to achieve, and what she was she was a Remainer. She 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 did she didn't technically want to leave the the uh, European Union and so she tried everything she could which she's she's done it she's she succeeded to say to to act over here on one position and actually push for another position and you know she had a little cry uh, it was kind of interesting but she didn't she didn't um in her in her resignation speech she didn't talk about uh the the issues that people uh wanted to hear she talked about climate change she talked about uh you know defense she talked about you know getting honoring the people's honoring the people's referendum 
Uh, none of which she's done. And, and climate change, she went on about that for a long, long time during her resignation speech. So it's like she's not hitting on the big ones of identity, of immigration, of, of crime, of knife crime in London. She's not, she's not talking about like the, 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 the national feeling. You know, she's not, she's not talking about anything that the British actually want to hear. So, yeah, I, no, people don't really feel sorry for her. Um, she probably should never have had the job. She was sort of an accidental prime minister. It, it probably wasn't supposed to happen. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that, uh, uh, that she's even there at all. Yeah, the Conservative Party, they wasted three years with her as prime minister. Uh, Boris Johnson, who everyone wanted to uh, replace David Cameron when he resigned mm. after the referendum, he ended up not running because his uh, former um, ally, Michael Gove, was, was going to, to run as well, and they ended up knocking each other out. Now, Boris Johnson is the front runner this time. He's offered a hard Brexit by the new deadline by October, saying that if agreement can't be reached, we'll just uh, crash out. And everyone's saying that he's setting the standard for what Brexit should be. And Theresa May, she she clung on to wanting to have some sort of deal. I don't know why it was so important to her, but let's also remember that Theresa May, she called an election three years early in, in 2017 because she thought she was going to get a overwhelming majority against Jeremy Corbyn and ended up being a hung parliament uh, and weakened her position and like she was never going to recover from that. No, yeah, so Boris John Johnson is the household name. He's the one everyone knows about. And... Um, it's the rise of the Germans. You think about it. You got Trump in the, in the U.S. and then you got Boris uh, in the U, in the U.K. So it's the rise of Germany all over the world. Um, no, but uh, yeah. So so Boris Johnson is uh, is is the household name. He's the one people wanted, and he was he was a Brexiteer. He was a full on Brexiteer. But he did uh, sort of deny that position, and they did leave her to the mess. And that's that's the unfortunate. Um, part about it is they all, like Nigel Farage they all bowed out but Nigel said oh uh, he's going to bow out of being a PM because uh, his his whole he's not a career politician and his whole his whole stick was to just get Britain out of the EU super state but now it's all happened again while well, he's, he's he's come back so. yeah well it so, sort of looks like he retired too soon well he didn't retire he just stepped down as as UKIP a leader, mm. uh, but he he's come back with the the Brexit party. They they came first. They've got twenty nine seats, thirty one point six percent of the vote. Liberal Democrats, the the strongest Remain party, they got sixteen seats, twenty percent of the vote. You had Labor collapse. You had the Conservatives collapse even further, down to a measly three seats. And you also had the the Greens and the Scottish National Party uh, slightly up. So yeah, that's what we were talking about before the the major parties. Yeah. So so the Brexit party, it it, it depends whether this was a protest vote against so so whether the people are trying to say because the people the uk especially because it's such an old democracy the people have worked out how to uh talk to their leaders through votes very strategically and it's it's hard to know whether or not that this was a protest vote against the big parties saying hey we're not happy with what you guys are doing look what we can do to you in a general uh, a general election in 20 in, in 22 um or or it was a genuine vote, and it's a reflection of what they might be might be looking to do in these general elections. I mean, the UK is such an old democracy. We know that we know that they can push big parties around and push them out eventually if they're not happy with it. it's happened before. Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't it wouldn't and couldn't happen again. Um, but yeah, that's the big debate: is it a protest vote, or is it something more genuine? Is it something where? this could really really put pressure on the government uh and the big two big parties to really uh think about the, their position in the general election could that that's that's massive um if not if it's still the left sort of two evils thing then um this is a this is kind of yeah it's a protest vote i guess well the european elections the the uk people they're not voting for a government mm. they're they're voting for 
how they, they feel about Europe. And so uh, UKIP uh, came first in, in 2014, five years ago. And so Brexit parties, uh, it's, or you'd call it its successor, has come first as well. But in the 2015 general, uh, UKIP uh, didn't do well. Nigel Farage failed to, to win a House of Commons uh, seat. But let's get to the, the Brexit party, which... Uh, basically has all of the old guard of, of UKIP, which left at the end of last year because they, they didn't like the direction that new leader Jared Batten was going, embracing the, the anti-Islam uh, movement in the UK. He hired uh, Tommy Robinson uh, as, an, as an advisor. There was sort of a lot of, a lot of people sort of wondering why is Farage, you know, he's so, he, he's so uh, upset about this. But a, a Brexit party as a single issue party, it's it, it's been a success, and and UKIP uh, f only got three percent of the vote. I mean, it's nothing now. Yeah. So Tommy Robinson also campaigned, and he didn't do very well. Yeah, two point two four percent of the vote in Northwest England, thirty eight thousand votes. Yeah. So so basically, he got the same as almost Fraser Ranning here in Australia. So those two campaigned kind of on the same issues, and you can tell the sort of relative mm. um of the two countries how many people care about those issues yeah people might say that's bad but i think that's not too bad for a uh for a vote i mean th for almost forty thousand. uh you're a single independent person a uh, big name obviously he's got it but but for people to actually vote for you that's actually that's actually pretty good um but again percentage wise it's not it's not good enough to get him over the four percent or anything like that but um on Brexit, yeah, it's a single party issue, which tells you what the actual issue is in uh, in Britain. And the, the issue is that people voted for a clean Brexit and they want that delivered and that the parliament is not delivering on a clean Brexit. And therefore, until a parliament does deliver on a clean Brexit, they, they're going to keep um, swaying their, their, their votes and their feelings towards uh, people that people that do support that notion um like you said ukip did very well in in that um but this is but nigel farage is a bit of an elitist he's a bit of a um he's a bit of a you know snotty nose if you want well, he's a merchant banker yeah yeah he's a bit of a snotty like he, he is a bit of a toff and um and he i can see why he wouldn't you know why he would think he was above the whole islam jared batten ukip lower thing um Jared Batten, he had to go, he didn't run, he ran with popular, sort of popular-ish candidates, like people like uh, Sagan Avocard and and that uh, that other one, um, the, the, the vampire type guy, They're both very big on social media, but, um, you know, these, these guys are not, you know, they don't have any political experience, they don't have any, they, they're not, they've never been elected. Yeah, they don't know how to fundraise, that sort of thing. No, they just know how to run big YouTube channels and critique look, the hard left and mm. all this sort of stuff and, and how to get eyeballs. So, you know, Gerard Batten, um, he tried, uh, you got Katie Hopkins over there supporting him, you know, trying to get some attention, waving about, um, but it, it, it's not enough. If people, people want it, uh, are interested in that big issue and that big issue is get Claude Juncker out of my life. Well, it shows then that the, the left in the, the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum, uh, they claim that people were voting for, you know, racism, but like, of course, being anti-Islam is not racist, but it shows that the, the people in 2016, they, they weren't voting on you know any particular like immigration they were just voting on leaving the european union yeah yeah so it would be actually kind of i've, I've always wanted to ask a lefty you know if islam is a race then what race is it like i want to turn this on the head because if if you're a lefty and you and you advocate this idea that um islam is a race i mean what race is it because then it probably end up being Arab, I guess, maybe, because that's the majority, but mm. there's also a lot of Chinese Muslims, and there's Pakistani, all, pa Pakistani and, uh, well, if you're in Britain, you call them Asian or whatever, mm. but, um, I mean, what, what race is it? I, like, actually, if you advocate that position in the comments, tell us what race is it, um, or if it generally is a race and not a religion, then that's really, really weird. I, I, I just want to turn it on their head and say to you out there, 
please tell us and explain how that actually works because I mean it doesn't make any sense but all you ever hear on that position is oh it's not a race it's a religion and but let's actually hear from their perspective on how how it's defined as a race anyway what were we saying so yeah so it's not racist oh there was a there was a time when Nigel Farage stood in front of a bus with a whole bunch of uh, uh, invading refugees or whatever they were and they said oh well that defines how it's right but that's 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 a subject it's a subject called mass immigration you know from uh, from from all these places so um, no, it's it's a it's a whole the EU creates a whole forest of laws. It creates a whole a mechanism of bureaucracy. It sucks uh, money and it sucks. It's like a giant vacuum cleaner that sucks the life, the money, and, and the and the energy out of countries uh, to create these giant bureaucracies. And people say we don't want that because we want to make decisions here in our country. You, the UK is uniquely positioned. To reconnect with the Commonwealth, to re reconnect with the WTO, it has it's really good friends with uh, with the US, which Europe is slightly not right now. <laughs> so you know, so so you the UK can do okay on its own. It just doesn't have that many people, yeah. You know, but it can do okay. It's on its own. It's a seafaring nation. It'll be fine. It has its own space agency. It doesn't need the EU space agency like some of these little countries. It'll be all right. So that's what that's what they want. They said, let's just leave and let Europe do its own thing, we'll trade with Europe, we'll be friends with Europe, that's fine, but we don't want to have our laws made over there and hear this giant sucking machine of billions of dollars every year going to support people we never heard of. Uh, going back to Tommy Robinson, he blamed his uh, small vote on the fact that he was uh, banned from Facebook where he had over a million followers. Now, he's he's got a growing Telegram channel. Last time I checked, he's nearly up to to 40,000, but it's a, it's a lot less than you know, uh, he had on, on Facebook. But everybody knows who, who to uh, Tommy Robinson is. Um, obviously, Tommy's campaign, it was a sort of shoestring campaign. It was just him, uh, supporters like Avi Yemeni going around the ra around the country. It didn't have the, the big resources that, because basically the Brexit party, it was starting all over again because Nigel Farage and the other UKIP MEPs felt that the party was ruined and so they had the, the political skills to to create a new one, have a reincarnation and it's worked in less than six months. Yeah, so so the Brexit party had a lot of money behind it, um, a lot of $25 donations which was the price to sign up. Um, and so it had it had a couple of million dollars it also had big people like uh that that the the guy who owns uh, 700 here in seven or 900 pubs in the uk i forgot his name sorry about that um but he owns about seven or 900 pubs in the uk and he donated a, a huge amount of money as well so um they had big supporters then they also had old guard from the conservative parties coming over and then they had you know the, the general the general public which also rallied to their cause so the brexit and a lot of ukip people uh move over so the brexit party was very well positioned it was only less than six weeks old so it had a very short campaign uh it had a very short time to generate a lot of enthusiasm um, to turn around at the end of the, uh, and say, you know, we uh, are the party that's going to represent this issue. You're right, it's only a one-issue party, and it's only the European elections. Uh, and that's why it's up to, it's, that's why it's so, is, is, is this a protest vote? Will this have uh, implications at the general? Because uh, Labour, uh, Jeremy Corbyn didn't know what he was doing. He had a little bit of everything. Like he stood there with the Lib Dems on one hand and he waved around and he said, oh, well, we'll support these guys. But then he also had some Brexiteers there and he was saying, well, we've got to honour the refer referendum for yeah, democracy. Yeah, I mean, Corbyn, he, he wants uh, Brexit to, to have his input on it. He's been pushing a lot of uh, amendments to, to protect uh, c uh, certain uh, industries and um, uh, interest groups. So, so he's... He's been a lot better than his party. Yeah, um, yeah. They they use the environment as a as a way to you know we have to protect these environmental laws as a way to um, say bureaucracy. <laughs> but um, 
Uh, yeah, so I don't know. He he was a bit all over the place, and we, their 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 vote collapsed as well because people didn't really know what they were standing for. See, uh, it's very clear with the Brexit Party. We want out because that secures our democracy. Because right now, British democracy, whether whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for people out there, it's something that's very very old, and they've always respected until now. For some reason, now they don't like it. And so the elites have gone back on that democracy. And even even the suggestion that, um, you know, that there should be another referendum. Well, if you actually add up the, the statistics on what just happened, it's the same as the referendum. It's basically if you add it all up, it ends up at uh, 5248, which is the same as the referendum. So the people saying over and over and over again on this issue, respect our voice. And, and the elites, they didn't do that. The, the, the Westminster folk, they didn't do that. And so that's what they're so angry about. And so Jeremy didn't have decisive leadership. He said, oh, we'll have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I'm trying to please both sides. While Teresa says, oh, yes, I, I, I am definitely pro-Brexit. <laughs> but her party is absolutely not. And she let them get away with it. So people said, all right, we're, we're, we're sick of this. Um, we're going either, either way. We're either saying... We're either saying Lib Dems, which is totally anti-democratic, and that'll open up a whole gateway of, of crisis, or we're going Brexit Party, which will respect democracy, at least on this issue, and then we'll try and repair democracy after that. Well, the Conservative Party, after their, their decimation, I mean, they have to deliver on Brexit this time uh, by October. That's what Boris Johnson ha has promised. I mean, it's, it's at the stage now where they've either got to support Brexit or die. It's interesting that a lot of uh, Labour MPs are now saying oh, we should support uh, a second referendum. That's what Deputy uh, Tom Watson has said, that oh, we need to, to, to get back votes we, we, from the Lib Dems and the Greens. We need to uh, be uh, pro uh, remain and now this second referendum folly it's basically because parliament can't agree to a deal and so you put the deal to the voters in another referendum but the voters they only get the choice of accepting a crap deal or remaining in the eu which is is not what they voted for they already voted to leave the european union yeah, so that's very interesting, Tim. So Theresa May actually said, I think a hundred. They, they counted it up, like a hundred and eighty-three to five times in public that Brexit was going to be on May fifth or whatever, and uh, it didn't happen. So uh, with Boris Johnson, um, I think he would do it because he was a Brexiteer. He was, he, you know, he, we all saw him zip line down. Uh, waving the flag and you know we will leave and he went in the car spinning around and and we, we all saw that and um and i think boris won't lie i think he'll he'll either have a deal or he won't it just done but um teresa as she was a remainer she she decided all right that's it but they don't have a presidency so they can't override parliament yeah it's it's still in a very precarious place uk politics i mean brexit has dominated the the politics for the, the past three years yeah absolutely and rightly so because they had a referendum uh david david cameron give, gave them a referendum the referendum choice the the the, the what the what the left say the referendum we never had to have and um yeah they he gave them the choice and they said leave and they haven't done it and um they didn't even have to inv invoke article 50 uh but they did and so they've extended and extended and pretended and pretended and it's it's running out of time and and that these results might be a reflection of 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 the general election because if if they are then these big parties better do something. Do something now. Well, they've got time. Uh, they're the next general election because the UK has five-year terms isn't due until 2022. Mm. I don't think that either party is wanting to uh, go to an early election given the, the European election result in 2017. Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn said, you want an early election, uh, bring it on. But uh, they'll certainly want to sort of sharpen their uh, positions. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, it looks like he'll stay as Labour leader. I mean, the, the moderates in the, the Labour Party, they haven't been able to 
uh, unseat him. Uh, as we mentioned, Change UK, it's born out because people think there's too, mi too much anti-Semitism in the, the UK Labour Party. But yeah, they haven't been able to blast Corbyn off that chair. Yeah, no, and 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 I I think he will hold on for a for a good while longer. Um, uh, you know, he's he's it, it's very hard being a lefty nowadays because you have to balance uh, on this great mass of moderate lefties and a very angry, noisy, hard left, which is growing. Um, it's the same here in it's the same here in Australia. Um, and it's not not so much to an extent in the in the US. It's, the reason is because Bernie has most of those guys under control. Um, they break off a little bit, but Bernie has those guys under control. Here in Australia, you've got a very radical Greens, you know, um, agenda, and that fuels this very uh, radical sort of break off, which is barely in control by Labor here in Australia. Um, and which Bill Shorten struggled with. So they go around saying we have to ban Sky News and shut down the internet and you know and, and, and do all this crazy stuff. And Bill's, it's very hard for someone like Bill Shorten to control that crazy left, especially when he's not being assertive. Um, and also he keeps coming out with his own radical policies. In, in the UK, um, he's got a different problem. There's the same sort of problem in the UK. You've got Jeremy who's sort of, it, because they, they, they the, the, the big thing about anti-Semitism and stuff is because they, they stack minorities hardcore in their votes, and a lot of the a lot of the minorities, are Muslims and others, who are anti pro British, you know, traditional British people, uh, the tr 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 traditional British voters, but they're still highly conservative people. They're still highly traditional conservative people that have nothing to do with the actual party that they that they are a part of, the Jeremy Corbyn thing. So they so they call themselves Labour. They run around and look like Labour, but they're actually fundamentally, you know, um, very traditional conservative, and they hold on to their old views. And oh, there's a lot of anti-Semitism that floats around in those old views. It's not it's not the same as here as in. It's not the same some, sometimes here in, uh, in Australia where some of those minorities are uh, Chinese or such which have businesses and they, and they float the other way. They float the conservative way because it actually benefits them. Uh, this, is, this in the UK, it's a, it's a different dynamic altogether. And yeah, so yeah, change, but Change UK should be deleted. They should just merge with the Lib Dems. Now, there was a lot of hope and uh, momentum after the, the 2016 Brexit referendum that other uh, EU member states would, would be able to leave. There, there was obviously Marine Le Pen, she wanted uh, France to leave. Uh, there's, there was obviously the, the Party for Freedom uh, in the, the, the Netherlands, but given how difficult the, the Brexit process has been for, for Britain three, three years on, it's sort of... Uh, it, it's diluted the momentum in in those other places. But um, Marine Le Pen, the, the national rally, they outpolled uh, Emmanuel uh, Macron's party in the, the European uh, elections. Although in Germany, the, the alternative for Deutschland, they only got around 7%. The, the, well, Germany is the heart of the EU. They still voted for the Christian Democrats, the pro-EU party. Yeah, well, because it, it benefits the majority. Um, EU is the uh, Germany is the big exporter in all this. So uh, Germany uh, Germany needs uh, sort of um, a cheap euro in a way because they they're the giant exporter. They're trying to compete with China. They have problems with China more than anybody, and um, so they need their periphery to be breaking down, and then they need to to use the surplus to control that periphery. And that's what Greece and the Mediterranean, and that's what um, Italy, even to a lesser extent, um, and Spain to, uh, to a lesser extent, that's what all of that is about. It's about, it's the same, it's the same thing in the US. It, like, uh, like, the more problems that happen in Mexico, so the more drug cartels, the more deaths, the more fighting, the, the, the cheaper the peso is, so that they want instability in that country. Um, so that they can push their to push their manufacturing there and, and all that sort of stuff so it's cheaper to manufacture and just import back into the US. That's what Germany wants in these in these other countries. So the Christian Democrats, although they they get they get swamped 
Um, the German people have kind of lost their will. They, they don't really um, fight for that much right now. So all they can do is individually stack money. So that's why the Christian Democrats are doing so well because, uh, and they have been for such a long time, is because the actual periphery of Europe breaking down is of no concern to them. They don't care about that. They're, they're, as long as the European, as long as Brussels can hold in with all these mechanisms, and you're right, Tim, it's it's been a hectic time just getting the UK out of out of there. Um, it's 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 showing it's show, um, the, the interesting thing is the UK is such a big block. It's an unusually big block that that wants to do it. We haven't had really test cases with smaller blocks, which probably would have the, re, the like 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 Cyprus or something probably should have left when they had the when they had the banking crisis. Um, but they didn't so we've got this big test case with with uh with uh brexit and and in, uh, in the uk which means that it sets a precedent for what others and how easily and all that others can do it and because it's the big one you know it's 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 how it's how it can do it so um so they need so Europe needs to make this as complicated as possible. It needs to make it as painful as possible to, to show all these other countries that you don't leave, uh, while it still still continues to spend and buy off these peripheral nations in uh, for uh, Germany, uh, so that they continue their instability uh, mechanism to cheapen exports in order to make Germany essentially stronger. Um, so yeah, so because Germany is competing with China, so. Um, yeah, so I'm not surprised that the Germans are still swinging Christian Democrats. Um, the, the nationalists in a lot of these countries, uh, Austria, Hungary, all these sort of stuff, um, you can you can watch the nationalism coming towards Germany as it as it sort of as it sort of the, it gets more. So you had the um, you had the Golden Dawn first way back in in, uh, in in Greece way back in 20 2011 or something, and they were the first sort of hardcore people and then as it as the destruction gets more it gets closer and closer to germany and so, and right now we're at oh we're at about hungary uh we're you know it's coming but it's not it's not right at the doorstep of vienna yet if you know what i mean so so that's that's kind of interesting so i can see why the german populace main because they're still making money they're still getting rich they're still uh doing very well from the destruction of europe and they'd want to continue that, but uh, the ADF is definitely the one to watch. Yeah, and they were initially just a sort of soft Eurosceptic party, but obviously with the migrant crisis affecting Germany the greatest, they've been able to do well in a lot of uh, state and, and federal elections, and that's obviously helped uh, nationalists um, in the South, such as as Viktor Orban, Law and Justice Party in Poland, uh, Sebastian Kurz in Austria, though he's facing a no-confidence motion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Kurt, that's very sad that, that he might be caught up in a corruption scandal. Uh, I read that. He, he's been very strong, um, very powerful, very strong. And yeah, now he might be on his way out, but he'll be re replaced by someone better, I hope, and hopefully they, they can um, continue. Yeah, so Europe, Europe is a very dynamic, p politically interesting place, and that's why I like, uh, I like focusing on Europe. I think Europe's uh, an extremely... Uh, it's a, it's a place of extreme change right now. The, the the hard right and the hard left, and and when people say, oh, you know, you're just a Eurosceptic, you know, you just, I, I've tried, I've written things, I've done things, and I've tried to sh show the European Union and the people how to adjust their policies so you don't get the hard right and the hard left. Because I'm actually really scared of the hard left. I mean, that's 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 the big genocidal crazy uh, one that we don't want, and. So I've been, you know, so I'd rather the center win than the hard left. You know, the hard right or the the right doesn't bother me so much, but the the left is what we want to stop. And I've tried to I've tried to advocate and and show the European Union, especially. I I have um, some friends in European Parliament, one of which I'm trying to get on this show, uh, and you'll meet later. Uh, hopefully, we can do that. If you, I I think you might get elected again, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've tried to I've tried to show the european union this is what you should be doing in order to 
A, maintain yourself if you want to be maintained, but don't let the hard left rise. But they don't want to listen because they're in a bubble. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about the big issues. And they don't care about, uh, you know, they don't, they don't care about European history. They're trying to rewrite uh, European history in their own image. And it's turning into a Tower of Babel situation or Babel. Well, the, the hard right leaders, the, the nationalists, they're being elected in Eastern Europe because they remember what it was like to be part of a, a pan-European uh, uh, bloc in the, the Soviet Union and its satellite states. And so they remember how much they suffered during that Cold War period. And that's why they've swung nationalist. And while uh, Western Europe has gone for these postmodern, liberal, globalist, uh, elitist bureaucracy parties. Yeah, so so you, Europe has done a reverse. It's it's done it's done a complete reverse. So you've got yeah, the old Soviet Empire is breaking up and becoming stronger in their in their national identities, while the core of Europe, which is which is Germany, uh, and, and its peripheral, which includes France and and, and others, um, in Scandinavia. Um, yeah, it's, it doesn't, it's just given up on the, it's just given up and it said, all right, we hand over all of our identity to, to, um, an unnamed institution in, in Brussels. So yeah, it's a very, it's a very weird situation. Um, it's not the worst crisis that Europeans have ever faced. Uh, it, it faced much, much greater crises, but what they are doing, which is scary is allowing a, basically a fifth column to be built. Uh, within their country uh, countries and uh, that will be the the cause of massive massive turmoil in the future yeah, and we should also say that the the European Parliament that that's elected it has no real power it can only vote on uh, legislation that that's put forward by the the European Commission it can't initiate legislation most of these laws are created by the the bureaucracy. bureaucracy, that's sort of why we call it a sort of virtue signaling election because the, the main games are still going to be the, the proper national elections to come. Uh, the next one uh, in France and the Netherlands the, the, and of course the UK, they'll be the one to watch. Germany's just had theirs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So it's the it's the bureaucrats, it's the Jean-Claude Junkers and it's, it's the bureaucrats nobody's ever heard of uh, that do it because it was born out of the coal and steel community. Uh, in the 1950s when they rammed all that together and it just kept growing it just kept getting stronger and, and the european federalists said oh you know we can we we know what we can do with this Euro uh, economic treaty so at the base of it is an economic treaty and uh and it's still basically just an economic treaty um uh, between all these countries so yeah it's it's uh it's it's european federalism by stealth and uh it, yeah it's just grown uh, like a like a cancer out of out of out of that idea which was just simply uh reducing tariffs on steel trading well we'll follow the the next uh, stage of this european uh project uh, closely as we have in the past thanks for joining me and giving your analysis steel thanks very much tim and i i enjoy the show i love i love tu waves i think it's a fantastic show you always have very interesting guests on very interesting people on and thanks to everybody who's come on because it makes it a great show and it always it's always a lot of fun and we've got some exciting episodes in the works, so stay tuned for those. As I stated on the Uncuckables last Thursday, I'm on a 30-day Facebook ban, so I'm spending more time on free speech social media, where The Unshackled also has a presence. We're at, on gab.ai slash The Unshackled. We're also on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. We also have a MeWe page at MeWe.com slash P slash The Unshackled. And we also have our growing Telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service T.me slash The Unshackled. Well, while we're talking about that, can I just say that if you Bing us, if you Bing The Unshackled, if you go to Bing.com and you type in The Unshackled, you're going to get unparalleled access to uh, The Unshackled. It's absolutely fantastic. If you go to Bing.com, just type in The Unshackled, you'll see all the videos, you'll see everything it's really really good you'll you'll know what i mean if you have a look there 
And remember that to continue operations, we rely on the financial support of our followers. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash theunshackled or directly via paypal.me slash theunshackled. You also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. Thank you to all those who've contributed recently. It all goes a long way. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.